Andrew Hollenbach. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Genetics at Louisiana State University at Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. And today I'm interviewing Dr. David Malbranche, primary care physician, University of Pennsylvania Student Health Services. Welcome today, David. Thank you very much. So what is gender identity and how does it change over time? Um, gender identity is kind of more of an internal sense of who you are, what gender you tend to align yourself with. A lot of people will talk about a biological sex that you're designated with at birth, and that may be more based on your anatomic organs or how you look and uh, present physically, but gender identity is an internal sense in the mind of how you identify, and that can be from a binary male, female, or anything in between. And what terms are frequently used within the LGBT community to refer to transgender or gender nonconforming individuals? Uh, it runs the gamut and it changes almost every week. So it could be anything from uh, gender queer to just queer to gender nonconforming. Um, I mean, obviously, gay, bisexual, uh, same gender loving, two spirited. You'll hear a lot of different things that people use. I think one of the important things that folks talk about is particularly in like epidemiology or in public health medical circles when they say something like men who has sex with men, that's just describing a behavior or who your sexual networks are, uh, what gender people uh, perceive them to be, not necessarily kind of how you identify it on the inside. And I think it's an important uh, point to note that a lot of people don't actually claim a certain identity and have that go through the rest of their lives. Like for instance, I had a patient that came to see me and initially when they came to see me, they identified as agender. Um, and I remember I tried to get them to kind of choose one or another or like say, well, how do you identify? And they said agender, asexual, um, but wanted to be on hormones for a longer period of time to kind of make themselves appear more ambiguous. And this person had been born um, genetically as a male or biologically as a male. Uh, and over time, over the span of about a year, a year and a half, they changed it and came to say to me at some point, well, I'm gonna change my name to a more feminine pronoun and a more feminine name and identify more as a female now. So I think it's important for providers, even though we consider this slew of uh, terms that we use for gender identity or sexual identity, all those different terms, that we actually give people freedom to kind of move because it could be in flux, particularly during adolescent and emerging adulthood. Right. How can health professionals create a, an environment or a clinical environment that supports these individuals, the transgender and not gender nonconforming individuals? Right, um, I think there's a lot of things from a clinic standpoint and from an institution standpoint we can do. Uh, some of those could be considered just having materials out in the waiting area that are you know, gender nonconforming or not gender specific or gender binary to having restrooms that may not have specific male or female designations to them. Um, and so I think those are syst systemically things that can be done. And then also within electronic medical records, charting papers that patients fill out, make things a lot less gender specific or binary and make them more gender neutral. So the patient has the choice to kind of put how they identify in. Um, when you think about it on more of an individual level, I think providers, and this could be nurse practitioners or uh, physician assistants, um, as well as medical doctors, just kind of treat the patients as humans um, and just go in and no matter what you think they look like or what your assumption is about what their gender performance is or who they are biologically, instead of trying to figure that out, a lot of times it's simple just to ask the patient, how do you prefer to be called? or what pronoun do you want me to use for you? Or how do you gender identify? Or how do you sexually identify? And then when you ask the question that way, the patient gets to answer you in that way. So it's not necessarily you putting your assumptions on them, but you actually ask them. And for some people, it can be a very awkward moment when you say to somebody that may look in front of you as if they fit what is usually consistent with a male or a female presentation, and then say, well, how do you prefer to be called or what pronoun? It seems awkward to say that sometimes, so I think it's almost the programming uh, our providers to actually step outside of that box and ask more questions of the patient up front. And you've found that many of the patients are receptive to such types of questions. Yeah, it seems usually, and I, it's interesting because I remember um, when I used to practice in Atlanta, I used to work at an HIV clinic and there was a patient, and I'm forgetting, uh, he was born a male, but his, he had changed his name to Angel when he transitioned as trans. Um, and I remember I spoke to one of the nurses and I would always call and I remember asking her, I said, you know, do you prefer to be called Angel? And she said, yes. I said, do you prefer to be called, you know, her or she? And she said, absolutely, yes. 
And I remember one of the nurses came up to me afterwards and said, well, what did he say? And what is he doing? And you know, did you talk to him? And was using his male pronoun that he was born with. And I said, well, do you know she prefers to be called Angel? And the nurse looked at me and said, well, does he still have uh, a penis? And I said, um, yeah, she hasn't had surgery yet. And then the nurse said, well, I'm gonna call her a him, if that's okay. And I remember thinking about that and thinking to myself like, okay, and this was at an HIV clinic, mind right. you, where people are supposed to be a little bit more culturally competent and see a more broad range and diversity of sexual orientation and gender identity. And this was still happening. And so it struck me as a little bit funny. So I think the patients appreciate it and they respond better, but it kind of brought to me the importance of it's not just that provider because the same patient will have to interact with the front desk staff, <laughs> uh, phlebotomist, maybe a PA or a nurse practitioner, and then maybe an educator or someone else along the continuum. So I think everybody needs to be kind of trained in that, in that kind of respect. So following off of that statement, where, what resources are available for um, individuals and clinics to go to to get this training or to be, have a better understanding of um, this population? Yeah, there's different sources. I know the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, their website and their organization has a lot of information. Um, the CDC actually, believe it or not, has some information online. Mm. Um, University of San Francisco does uh, and has some wonderful uh, trans resources. The thing that's kind of still a little bit varied with this is that there's not one template where you could like Google something and say, right. well, okay, give me something on trans health. And sometimes when you look at the American, like the Association of Endocrinologists, their focus is more clinical. Like how do you prescribe hormones? How do you do this? But before we even get to that part, I think a lot of the providers need to be trained on kind of what resources are available. Um, for instance, in Philly where I practice now, there's actually a Philadelphia trans resource guide, mm -hmm. which is meant for patients that has things like community-based organizations, places to get support, um, physicians that may be culturally competent, surgeons, in case they're considering that. And so it's good for the patients, but on some aspects, it's also good for the providers to actually look up, uh, up some of that stuff. Um, if I were to just tell a provider to Google you know, trans health, they could find a whole myriad of things that are just awful or not accurate. Right. Um, but specifically, I think the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association or some of the major universities in select cities may have something and specific resources for both patients and providers to help with right. that. Good. What, what are some of the key concepts that are important for all health professionals to know and, and how can they be taught within the health profession education? So for example, during medical school education. Right, um, I think for medical school education, it's hard. So a lot of people complain within our medical school systems that there's just not enough time. I mean, they're taking in all the anatomy, the histology, the clinical information, and they just don't have time to do a lot of this psychosocial stuff, and particularly when it comes around sexuality because it's kind of a taboo topic. Uh, some medical schools have sectioned out a sex week so they can talk about some of this and they've made it mandatory for some of the medical right. students, like the second year medical students or the third year medical students. Um, other programs have actually integrated it more effectively. So you may have a program where you're doing problem-based learning, which is medical school-based learning in the first couple of years where everything is kind of based on a system. So for three or four weeks, you may have the cardiovascular system and you learn everything in that system from the biochemistry to the anatomy to the histology, everything like that. And they'll present cases of a patient that comes in as a springboard to learn about all those different aspects of that system. And I think if you start to incorporate diversity in gender identity, um, sexual identity and order, orientation into those capacities, then that way it'll infiltrate into the learning system. So in other words, not having to reinvent the wheel and create something separate that I think when you look at the whole gist of things, uh, schools aren't gonna right. go with because they just don't think they have time. But I think it's gonna involve kind of an integrative approach where you actually include some of these clinical pearls and some of these lessons about respecting gender identity, asking the appropriate questions, being respectful of, you know, kind of someone and where they consider themselves, uh, where they consider themselves to be as far as their gender identity or sexual identity into these clinical scenarios. I think they'll learn it a little bit better. Right. Do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to leave with, with us? Um, no, I just think it's an important thing. I think at the end of the day, Gender identity is kind of a trickier thing than sexual identity um, because in some respects it can very much contrast with how someone appears to look on the outside. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, 
the safety net for a lot of providers would be to just ask the questions, ask an open-ended question. Right. What do you prefer to be called? Um, am I doing this right? And just make ourselves a little bit more humble. It'll go a long ways in establishing patient trust right. and will likely lead to better outcomes for all our patients. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much.